In this tutorial, we're going to learn how to set up some area lights to create a studio lit scene. And then we're going to go through some render settings to create a final render that should look something like this. This scene and the HDRI texture are available in the description below. If you're here from a previous tutorial, then you'll already have done the first step, which was to create a sky dome light. This would have helped you to create all of your shaders and see how they'd look with some semi-realistic lighting and also to see how they would reflect the environment. For the sake of this tutorial, I'm just going to delete it quickly and rebuild it so that we can create a lit scene from scratch. So I've gone into my outliner over here. I've deleted my sky dome light and we're going to build that from scratch. So I'm first going to go to Arnold Lights Sky Dome Light. I'll then click on the sky. So I'll orientate my camera to click on the sky. Go to the color over here in the attribute editor. If you can't see the attribute editor on the side, click on the attribute editor button up here on the top. And after clicking on the checkerboard for color, go to file, then choose the folder, then choose the HDRI. I'd recommend the Adams Place Bridge 4K HDR from the description below as it creates quite a nice neutral lighting that isn't overly blue or yellow. If you find the sky dome disconcerting in the distance, you can hide it. To hide it, we're going to go down to the attribute editor for the sky. So make sure you've got the sky clicked on and then scroll down to where it says viewport hit the drop down arrow here for viewport and change the sky radius to zero. This will make it disappear, although you can still see it clearly in the reflections of the sword. To bring it back, if you need to change anything, you can go to your outliner over here on the left and click on your sky dome light to bring up its settings again. The sky dome will still be visible in your renders. To hide it from your render, you can drag the camera slider down. So when you drag this to exactly zero, you can see it uh, disappear from your Arnold render view completely. The black area that's remaining is in fact an alpha channel so that when you render it off, the black area will actually be transparent as opposed to seeing the sky like this. Now you may notice that the reflection of the HDRI dome in the sword here is extremely pixelated. The first thing you need to check is that the HDRI itself is high quality, like a 4K image. The best place to get free 4K images is HDRI haven.com so you don't even have to sign in for this and you can even go up to 8 or 16k for free as well this isn't a sponsor i just can't believe they're free so uh, get one of those and even though you've done that it's still going to end up pixely like this so we have to go into the attribute editor for the sky dome again and change another setting if you've lost your attribute editor for the sky dome again you have to click in your outline over here to click on the sky dome and uh, you can then see its attributes on the right you should see where it says resolution for a 4k image I would recommend a resolution of 4000 and for an 8K image, 8000, etc. After you click away from that box, I'll refresh the render over here. You'll see the reflection looks a lot less pixelated. And if you think you can still see some pixelation in the reflection, then you may need to click on the material itself. So I'm clicking on my piece of sword here that's uh, got the chrome material on. And then in the attribute editor on the right for this chrome material, I'll go to the roughness and just increase that to 0.02. This will just start to blur out the reflection for this result here. If you're having trouble understanding the shaders I'm using from Arnold, then you'll need to watch the link in the description below for shaders in Arnold. I also have my textures on here with my lighting and shadows and ambient occlusion enabled up here as well to make the scene look quite nice. Now we're ready to add our lights. To help us do this without worrying about moving the camera all the time, we're actually going to create a new camera. So if you don't already have another camera, go to Create Cameras Camera. Now you'll see it pop up in the middle of your grid in Maya. Hit the space bar and choose one of your other views. I usually leave my top view, but I might go to my side view, for example, and space bar into my side view so it fills up the whole uh, frame. I'll then go to panels, perspective, and you'll see camera one is now listed in there. I'm now looking through camera one. It's in the middle of the grid, so it looks a bit weird. Simply spin it around. You can see your scene will probably look quite dark and weird. Just turn on your lights. And if you set up a nice angle, and if you turn on your resolution gate option up here, which is a blue circle inside a white frame, this will show you the final aspect ratio, which I've set to 16 by nine. And I'll show you how to do that later, but it's probably a good idea to have that set up now. And then make sure the camera that you're looking through is current Currently selected by clicking on this button up here to select the camera and hit S on the keyboard to set a keyframe for this particular angle, which means if you accidentally move it, you can wiggle your time slider and it will snap back to here. It's very important when combining this with another render pass like occlusion or depth. 
So you could now go to panels and then tear off a copy of this view here. This means that if you spacebar in the main view, go back to your perspective view, you can move around the scene while still keeping an eye on how the lighting or setup of the scene will look in this side view here. This is very useful for doing animation or for set dressing for a certain angle. However, I'm going to close this down and just open up my Arnold render view by going to Arnold render. And you then need to go to the drop down arrow here, which at the moment would say per shape for perspective shape change it to camera shape one and now no matter what you do with your viewport over here it will keep this view the same you can see in my computer it is very laggy despite a higher end processor and graphics card so I'll need to reduce my render settings a lot uh, if I want to see a live view as well as continue to use Maya over here just check that your render is set to run IPR that that's ticked that means it will continually update this scene no matter what you do in here you may occasionally need to go to render update full scene if something over here doesn't match what you have in your viewport. Let's make the settings worse now by going to your render settings up here by clicking on the clapperboard with the blue cog. Then you've got your render settings. We'll first change the size of our image. At the moment it's set to HD 1080. If you make sure yours is set to HD 1080 and then tick the box that says maintain width height ratio. Change the height to 320 then hit enter. The top value will automatically change to match the aspect ratio of that so we're still at 16 by 9 and to speed this up even more you can go to your Arnold renderer tab and reduce all of these numbers down to one like this to make it absolutely terrible this should make it a lot easier for your computer to do this in real time I'd now recommend just resizing your render view down and you can put it somewhere like the bottom left hand corner for now you can now close your render settings there's no save option just close it and it has updated it's now time to add some area lights so we're going to use area lights from the Arnold menu I actually already have one here I'm just going to delete for a second. So go to Arnold Light Area Light. You'll immediately see one appear in the middle of your scene. If you hit W for move and move it up above your geometry, you'll see that you've got a square with a green line pointing out. The green line that's pointing out like that is showing the direction that the light is facing. And this area light is equivalent to an LED panel or diffuse box for a bulb like this. Now at the moment, it's not emitting any light that we can see in either our viewport or our final render. To enable this, you can increase the intensity over here. You can also turn off normalize, which means the bigger the light will get, the brighter brighter it will get as well. I'm just going to move the light away from the sword a bit and resize up here like that. You can see it in the viewport having some kind of effect as you rotate it around, but it's not really doing much in the final render. So I'm going to put the intensity up to four and the exposure to four as well. And now you can see something happening over here. So for this scene, I'm going to have three lights. So I was going to put this one over here to the left like that. And I'm now going to enable use color temperature. There is no lights really that you can get that are pure white. They're usually either a little bit yellow or a little bit blue, depending on if they're LED or incandescent. So I'm going to make this light a little bit warmer by dragging it to the left. So as you drag it to the left, you will see it have an effect in your final render over here. You're not looking for it to look like red like that, but just a little bit yellow will look good. Now, there is a lot of noise and grain at the moment in your render. We do not want this in our final render at the end. So if we go to the sun, samples and increase the samples of this light to three. This has just made the light take about three times as long to render. So be careful at how much increase this value. I can now duplicate this light by doing control D and then hit W for move. I'm going to move this light to the other side like this. I'm now going to rotate my light. You may notice that when you move or rotate your lights, the axis of your move tool or rotation tool may be at different axis to what I have. I want to move this along with the grid. So I've, if you double click on your move tool, you can change your axis orientation to world instead of object, which means you can move this light across the floor like that. When I go to my rotation tool, by double clicking on it, you can see it's stuck to object, which means if I try and rotate it, it goes sort of at funky angles. So I'm going to change that to world and now I can spin this light around like this. So this is going to be my second main light and it's going to be on the right hand side over here quite far this way. I'm going to make the temperature of this light a little bit cooler, a little bit more blue. So now on our sword you've got a warmer sides and cooler sides. The scene's looking quite bright and I think it would look better if it looked a bit more mysterious and dark. So the first thing we'll do is decrease the light that the sky dome is casting onto the sword. To do this click on the outliner and then go to the sky dome light and decrease the intensity down 
down to 0.1 and you can still see it reflected in the blade of the sword but it's not lighting up the background quite as much so you get a sort of a nice darker area up here. I'm going to decrease the intensity of the light on the right by resizing it down. Again if you resize it down and it doesn't seem to get any darker make sure you've unticked the normalized box for the light. I could do the same on the left. I'm just going to duplicate the light one more time. I'm going to duplicate the warmer light with command or control D. Move it to this time the back of the sword. So I usually have my light set up like this. One on each side warm and cool for nice contrast and then I always have a light at the back facing the camera but I always have it quite high up so that you can't actually see it light up the floor too much and I might just uh, decrease the intensity by making it a bit smaller like that. If you want to see what a scene looks like with a light on or off if you really want to see if this light's having an effect on your final render with the light selected go to illuminate by default and turn it off. This is like the switch that turns a light on or off. So you can see that it's having quite a large effect of brightening up the scene so I am going to just scale it down a little bit more to intuitively reduce the brightness of it. Another thing you can do with these lights is if you uncheck the use color temperature you can choose a color instead. So if you want to be a bit creative and have like a slightly more of a like a purpley light or something uh, you can do that as well. So try and keep it as subtle as you can like that. The next step I'd like the floor to be a bit darker so it doesn't reflect as much of my light. So if you click on the floor plane you can go to the shader that has applied on the floor. Uh, make sure that your floor has a different shader to everything else in your scene and I think that my floor has a copper preset so I created an AI standard surface and set the preset to copper and change the color from bronze down to black. If you want to make it darker than this you can go to the specular color here and change how much uh, you'd like it to reflect. So even though making it darker, it's still reflecting the sword in this area down there. And that looks quite good. Now that I've done that, I might be able to move my light a bit lower down so it can lighten up the sword a bit without creating a large area that's too bright on the rest of the scene. And something like that works quite well. So my final light to set up are like this, but you can do what you like to be creative. So now we're ready to increase the render settings to do our final render. That is everything you need to know really about setting up um, area lights. Make sure that all three of your lights have samples set to three to avoid uh, having bad quality renders at the end. And go to your render settings with the clapperboard with the blue cog on it. We'll first go to the common tab on the left. Change the image size to 1080. So for the height you can do 1080 and the width will automatically go to about 1920. It won't always be perfect, so you can always uncheck maintain width height and change it to 1920. Once you resize the render, you might realize that you want to make a few more changes with the lights now that you can see it in a slightly better quality. And I've decided I want the light on the left to be a little bit brighter so it just throws out a bit more of a warmer color like this, which contrasts well against the blues. So now that the image is larger, you'll need to change well, the settings to get rid of all this grain down here. To do that, in your render settings for Arnold, go to the Arnold Renderer tab. And so for the anti-aliasing here, I'm going to put that up to four or five. Um, every time you increase this number above one, it will double the render time. So I would never really go above five. Increase all of the other values to 3, to so diffuse for the shading, specular for all the highlights, transmission for any glass that you have, and subsurface scattering if you have any organic shapes or gems or anything in your scene. I'm going to put that, leave that at 2 and that should be good. If you go down to adaptive sampling, if you enable that and set the maximum camera anti-aliasing to 15 and these numbers give me a good render at the end. This should take about five minutes on a i7 8086K or if you put it up to 1440p, it would probably take about 10 minutes. Usually in your Arnold render view, there's a blue loading bar at the bottom down here. It's gone and I have no idea how to bring it back, but you can see down here, it still says rendering. There is a value, the percentage number here is just how far in you are zoomed and when your render is complete you're going to want to save it if you're in your Arnold render window go to file and then go to file save image and I would always save this as an EXR file so if you just call this whatever and don't type in anything else after it, it will automatically be a JPEG if you type in another extension like one of these it will change to one of those you cannot just hit the drop down menu unfortunately so I'm going to choose to save this as EXR the reason is and it may not be apparent in this tutorial but if you save it as a JPEG straight from Arnold you'll end up with lots of banding you'll see these sort of banded lines in your final saved image although it won't be present in the render view it will be there in the JPEG it's due to how it's compressed to 8 bit 
it. If you save it as a EXR file, while the EXR file itself can only be opened in Photoshop, if you convert it to a JPEG, it gets rid of all of the banding. So I'll just show you that briefly. If you go to Photoshop and you should see your EXR file that you just saved, by default it goes to the images folder in this directory here drag the EXR into Photoshop. It comes up with this menu here. I usually use the as alpha channel option and it will save in. So the problem with EXR files is that they are about 80 times larger. So the JPEG image I just saved was only half a megabyte. This EXR is at about 20, sometimes up to 40 megabytes if it's the larger version. And then that can get quite uh, resource intensive. And you can also not do all the, your normal edits and stuff. So even if you unlock the layer, you'll notice that in Photoshop, lots of the menu options are grayed out because this is a 32-bit image. So we're going to go to image mode and change it to an 8-bit image and choose merge. This HDR toning window appears and you'll see your sword get a lot brighter. This is actually showing you the amount of information stored within this file and you can completely adjust the exposure to whatever you want. But from the drop-down menu here where it says method, choose exposure and gamma. This will change the colors back to how it was a moment ago. You can usually leave these at default, although feel free to increase the exposure to your liking. I usually leave this at zero and then you can do five save as and save it as a JPEG and set the quality to 10 or 11 as in the JPEG options, then hit OK. You can now do what you want to this image. Photoshop is a lot better at compressing it into a JPEG than Maya or Arnold. With these render settings complete, we can see that everything looks perfect but too perfect. The next tutorial will focus on applying the scratches and textures with the UV editor to give it a little more realism. Just a quick note that instead of rendering from the Arnold renderer, you can render from the built-in Maya renderer as well by clicking on the clapperboard with the eye or the empty clapperboard if you want to render straight away. But I usually click on the clapperboard with the eye and then I'll click on this snapshot button here, which will just do a quick wireframe render of the current scene just to allow you to confirm what you're going to render before you go ahead with it. To render this properly now, you hit the empty clapperboard icon in here and it will be Begin to render the final image. Unlike Arnold, it does not give you a real time but pixely view. It just simply stays blue until you hit render and then you can see it spiral around creating your final image. I find this easier to see that it's completed at first glance and it's usually the place I go to render my final images instead of from Arnold because uh, I know that they're all done and it's complete and it's also where I go to render image sequences but to save an image from here it's a little bit different. If you want to save a JPEG you'll go file save image and choose a JPEG from this drop down list and you must for a JPEG image choose color managed image on the right or it will save an image that it's too dark. However, as we know, if you save a JPEG image from Maya, you get the banding issue. So it's always best to save a EXR image. In this render view, it's called Open EXR. So you have to go right down to the bottom, find Open EXR. For saving EXRs, you must choose Raw Image. Otherwise, the final image will save too bright. So it's best to save this as a Raw Image Open EXR. Or for JPEGs, choose Color Managed Image JPEG.